I'm extremely excited to be able to speak to Professor Raywin Connell today, whose contributions to the study of gender and more specifically masculinity cannot be undermined. A sociologist and professor of the University of Sydney, she's well known for her theory of hegemonic masculinity, but also for her book, Southern Theory, which discusses the Northern metropolitan bias of social sciences and had also initially gained prominence on her studies of class. Thank you so much, Professor Connell, for joining us. Well, I'm glad to be here. Um, so I'd like to start off a bit about um, discuss um, with discussing gender and masculinity first. Sure. So in a previous interview you did, you attributed your interest to the study of masculinity and gender to a desire to reify and get a more comprehensive understanding of the mechanisms and the concept of the patriarchy, which you saw as being too abstract at the time. I was wondering whether you had managed to be able to like pin this down and in turn, maybe you could illustrate to us what popular forms of hegemonic masculinity might look like today. Um, the background basically is the, the women's liberation movement um, getting underway at the end of the 60s and uh, building up during the 1970s, um, which developed a critique of the, the dominance of, of men and therefore the, the masculinization of uh, organizational culture in the state, in the church, in the corporate world, um, <clears throat> basically across the society. And the movement sort of reached back into a, an old and largely forgotten literature um, uh, and came up with the concept of patriarchy. So the notion that we lived in a patriarchal society uh, where men and perhaps particular groups of men, middle-aged and older men, held most of the power and authority and wealth and organizational control. This kind of thing. This became, um, you know, a, a widespread way of, of talking, and it, it began to develop you know, models of how uh, this would help in understanding um, contemporary life as well as, as past societies. Um, but that concept too um, really did run into serious difficulties. Um, there was a tendency to use it in a very sweeping way to assume that all of human cultures were patriarchal, that patriarchy was age old, at least since 4000 BC or something like that. Um, and um, to, to generalize a, a particular experience, particularly that of global north, um, to, to the rest of the world. Um, so there was an element of ethnocentrism in that way of thinking, which began to be criticized. Uh, by indigenous women, by people who were not part of the, the establishment in the global, global north, by working class women, um, by black women in the United States especially, and by feminists uh, from around the, the post-colonial or just then decolonizing world, because there was still a process of decolonization at a political level going on in, in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so there seemed to be need for some other way of thinking that didn't have this degree of rigidity or, um, uh, or, or abstractness about it. And I guess one of the things that occurred to me in, in, in wrestling with these problems, many, many people um, in the women's movement and influenced by the women's movement were trying to do uh, by the late seventies um, was applying a, a, another concept that that circulated and uh, was certainly very strong in the, the student movement of the 1960s, which I was part of in, in Australia. Because when, when you're studying society, uh, the social sciences had a habit of studying the poor and studying the marginalized. So you would, you know, you would study um, you know, ghetto communities, you would study recent working class and migrant communities and so on and so forth. And that's what sociology and other science, social scientists to a very large extent did. Uh, but this meant basically you were studying the relatively powerless and churning out information about them. And who was going to use that? Uh, the powerful, of course, your ruling classes, your dominant ethnic groups and so forth were the potential beneficiaries of that kind of social science. So what you needed to do was turn the operation around and use your social science skills and techniques and concepts to study the rich and powerful and generate information about power structures and privilege and the reproduction and, and maintenance of privilege that would be useful to social movements struggling against inequality and injustice. Um, and there was a phrase for that, studying up um, rather than studying down. 
And I, I was one of the people who applied that logic to thinking about gender, gender relations. Uh, one of the things, if you wanted to understand a, a, a structure of gender, um, one of the things, one of the very first things you needed to do was study up, study the groups who benefit uh, from a system of inequality. What are they up to? How do they maintain their power if they do? Uh, what are the, um, the mechanisms involved? And also what are the weaknesses in the position? What are the potential points of, of change? So that's, the, if you like, the conceptual reason reasoning that, that led me to think it really mattered to understand masculinities, uh, the position of men in gender relations, um, the way masculinized culture came to characterize the elite levels of business and politics, um, the different patterns of masculinity, because that is something that emerges as soon as you start paying attention um, empirically. Uh, to, to men as gendered beings and therefore to masculinity as a configuration of social practices, um, you begin to recognize diversity, difference, uh, sometimes conflict between different patterns of masculinity. I, I have a follow-up question. Or I have a sure. follow -up questions. Um, I would like to ask how we could potentially be able to apply a similar analysis, such as that of hegemonic masculinity, to women. Is there a similar structure by which some traits in women are socially rewarded over others? Are these the mirror opposite of the male ones? Um, in that, you know, women might be, you know, soft and motherly and men might be, you know, stoic or, or as the concept of emphasized femininity suggests, is there a functional element of it wherein men set the standards for women based off what serves them? Mm. Yeah, there's an interesting discussion of, of this in the literature. Um, when, when we um, were first putting together the, the analysis in the study of schools, uh, we thought, yes, there is a, a kind of corresponding pattern among the girls. Um, so certain um, forms of femininity were most admired in, in girls' peer groups in adolescence. Um, that, that seems to be correct. Um, and, and that um, has been found uh, repeatedly in, in other studies too. You do find, uh, if you like, hierarchies of, of femininity. Um, and some researchers have said, yeah, we can use the, the idea of hegemony too. We can legitimately speak of hegemonic femininity. And indeed, we did that first too. Um, but on reflection, it didn't seem actually um, a, a, as helpful a concept as the concept of hegemonic masculinity because we were living in a patriarchal society where the... Um, the, the social position of women in gender relations and girls um, was not uh, dominant in the way the social position of men was. So that the, the most admired or desirable um, form of femininity did not have the position in the whole gender order uh, that hegemonic masculinity was likely to do, uh, or would do uh, in, a, in a situation of hegemony. Um, and, and for that reason, I dropped the concept of, of hegemonic femininity and said that what we need to look rather is at the relationships between constructions of femininity and constructions of masculinity. And it, it could be said in, in at least the kinds of situations that I was studying, and uh, perhaps more generally in Australian society and, and in many others at the time, um, that, that what was characteristic of the the, the, the most honored and admired form of femininity was not exactly power and authority, but a capacity to uh, attract heterosexual attention. That, that was something that um, gave enormous prestige uh, among many teenage girls at least. Um, and so uh, allowed the possibility of constructing romance relationships uh, with boys and young men who occupied the, the space that we were calling hegemonic masculinity. And the, the language that, that I came up with to describe that kind of pattern was the language of emphasized femininity. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps, perhaps that was a bit of a problem, uh, but there was a, a, a popular literature at the time, uh, more so I think than there is now, 
um, there was a kind of um, backlash to feminism among women uh, where uh, there were self-help manuals coming out and even little social movements. Uh, some of them were the religious base, some not, uh, some just kind of self-helpy, um, which were teaching women basically how to subordinate themselves to their hubbies. Um, you know, how to have the cocktail ready when husband was home, due home from the office, how to have a bubble bath an hour before he came home, get the lippy on, get into a nice frock, put on the heels, and, um, and take an interest in his interests and so forth, but don't overwhelm him with attentions. You know, I mean, it's an extraordinary literature, <laughs> that stuff. I mean, it's really quite creepy in a way, but it was very popular. Um, and, and I guess uh, it, it was looking at that kind of stuff right, when I was trying to get my bearings on social constructions of femininity uh, that led me to think of the, the corresponding thing to hegemonic masculinity was emphasised femininity, made such a big point of being a desirable woman that that became the central definition of femininity. Now, that, um, that wouldn't work in other settings. Um, there are... Um, <clears throat> Uh, for instance, in, in African feminisms, uh, there's a significant uh, line of thought that says, um, you know, what matters about the position of women uh, in traditional African societies of becoming mothers, uh, not becoming a subservient wife, but becoming a mother and having children, bring and raising the children. And uh, those who have been mothers will well know uh, that it's uh, very hard to combine uh, motherhood, um, uh, being responsible for, for uh, kids and their care and bringing them up, it's hard to reconcile that with bubble baths and mm -hmm. lippy at 4.30 in the afternoon and wearing high heels around the house and, and cooking in your best frock. You can't, actually can't do it except in, in advertisements. Um, so that wouldn't work uh, for any construction of femininity that centred on, on motherhood. Um, nor would it work for uh, women who you know, had skills and intellectual or physical capacity uh, and or the need to earn a living uh, themselves who couldn't rely on the man in the flat grey flannel suit coming home with the, the wage packet every week. Um, and a hell of a lot of women, that is most working class women, all peasant women, uh, actually work for a living. Um, and they're not going to be doing the bubble baths, et cetera, every time. So you have other constructions of femininity then in working class uh, milieu where women are obliged uh, to, to get jobs, uh, single mothers. Um, um, you know, there's a very wide spread of, of um, the uh, of situ practical situations that women find themselves in that would rule out um, those, those patterns that are the idealized femininity of the advertising world. Um, so yeah, the, the, the picture is, is much more complicated in reality than the, uh, the, the initial theorization suggests, but that's, you know, that's the way research works. You do learn more, you do understand more of the complexities and uh, it is still the case that we live in a patriarchal society. There are, enormous uh, economic and uh, cultural advantages held collectively by men. Um, we've uh, you know, made very little debt over 40 years of struggle in reducing the level of sexual violence, uh, reducing rape rates. We have maybe not reduced them at all. Uh, there are still appalling levels of domestic violence. Um, women are still uh, very rare at the top levels of, of power. Uh, in the corporate world, in terms of military power, for uh, if you are looking at the, the holders of power on a global scale, doing my studying up uh, on a world scale, uh, you're still looking at massively masculinized um, you know, elites. Um, and the, the you know, competitive um, emotion suppressing. Um, and ruthless the forms of masculinity that you find there are killing the planet. And I have a lot of people along the way to killing the planet. I mean, what are you saying? Um, um, so the, the struggle continues. And we, we, we have more uh, and, and some, 
sometimes more precise tools for understanding it, uh, whether they give us power to change it is another matter. That's, you know, there are limits to what research will do. Um, I mean, definitely it's something that myself and my peers have experienced, but it is also something we're actively trying to outgrow the whole like judging yeah. yourself and, you know, valuing yourself based off of um, male validation, I guess. Um, and in terms of the in terms of the pamphlets, I've actually encountered these a lot in my historical studies, and they're so interesting to look back at as sources, although a bit ridiculous. Um, but to, to the final part of what you were saying, um, I have two questions. One of them regards how femininity and masculinity vary based off of the culture in which you find it. Um, and I was thinking that leads me to the question of whether, um, whether there's anything ever that's inherent about these norms or whether they're just socially constructed um, based off of the, you know, their conditions, if that makes sense, in response to their environment. Yeah, um, I, it, it's, a, um, it's a classic. Um, you know, side of, of controversy and uh, and dispute in in thinking about gender, um, and you will still find people who uh, who consider that you know our biological constitution is is male or female, our reproductive biology uh, is all that matters, and everything else is is pretty phenomenal. I think a couple of recent popes have come out and and emphasised that, taken that position. Uh, there are some groups of feminists who take that position, which I find very problematic. Um, but it's also, you know, taken up by various right-wing political movements and leaderships who think there is some kind of mileage in, in propounding a you know, fixed biological notion of, of, of gender, gender model on a, uh, a somewhat weird assumption that a, with a heterosexual nuclear family, it's the only uh, natural form of human life, which most of human history obviously refutes. Um, but um, it, it, uh, also, I, I don't entirely buy the, uh, the the position that's often put up against that is the polarity that uh, gender is all about identity or about social norms. Um, roles and role performance. I don't think that's right either uh, because our embodiment does matter. Um, gender itself you know, has a connection with human reproduction. Uh, it's uh, often an indirect uh, remote uh, connection, but the connection is there. That's what distinguishes gender relations from say class relations um, as, a, as a social structure. Uh, so I think any good account of, of gender will reckon with our embodiment uh, and uh, it will you know, uh, reckon with the way human bodies are formed, uh, how they develop, uh, how they interact with each other, uh, not only sexually, but including that certainly, um, and how they age, uh, all of which become relevant to definitions of gender in a variety of societies. Well, having said that, and uh, 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 the, the notion of social embodiment, which I've been using in my recent writing, is my way of naming that kind of, of, of set of relationships and questions. Um, I'd also say that um, you know, forms of masculinity and femininity depend enormously on culture. Uh, they also depend enormously on economics. Uh, on, on how people earn their living, whether you're in a subsistence economy, a peasant economy, uh, an industrial economy, and what is your position in it, um, that uh, that matters greatly. Um, the, uh, um, the 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 language you, we have, including the conceptual languages we have for representing uh, our bodies, uh, our relationships, ourselves to the world. Uh, that you know, shapes how masculinities and femininities can, can be expressed and understood. Um, so you, you cannot get away from very powerful social determinisms while also recognizing that this is a, a, a social embodiment. Um, it's not independent um, 
of, of human bodies. Now, sometimes uh, when, when I try to explain these, these concepts, it sounds as if I'm trying to ride two horses at once, and that is perfectly true, uh, because I think gender is an area quite, quite dramatically where embodiment and social process, embodiment and history come together, um, <clears throat> thinking of, of society as something that is constructed in history and always open to change over time. That's true of gender relations too, which runs against uh, proverbs because, you know, the, proverbially, gender is what does not change. You know, oh, boys will be boys, you know. Oh, women are all like that. Uh, you know, this kind of proverbial statement, that was just quoting the title of a Mozart opera. You know, women are all like that. It's, uh, you know, it's part of the culture uh, to think that way. Um, and yet it's totally wrong. And it is factually wrong uh, to think that way. Forms of gender do change and change very, very profoundly through a historical time. Uh, and yet gender itself is connected with biology. It's connected with the way we reproduce directly or remotely. Um, so uh, if I have to sum up in a slightly paradoxical way what gender is about, it's about babies and history and how they're connected. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, of course, like based off of the last part that you said about, you know, boys will be boys, I feel like that's often used as, you know, a way to defer, you know, keep it like to not keep these people accountable a lot of the times because you're like, oh, they can't. Yeah. And based off of the previous thing that you said about, I feel like I have this thought that potentially a super, you know, hyper constructivist view of gender, which kind of suggests mm. that, you know, it's all socially constructed. It just gets imposed on you based off of like, you know, historical developments. It doesn't really matter. I feel like potentially that undermines, you know, trans people as well in some way, um, in the sense that like, it, it makes gender seem as though it's something that you know, you're just you're just given a set of rules and everybody just accepts them and that's it to it, doesn't it, in a way? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that's that's a, a that's also a complicated terrain too, because when when people use the term trans people, which I think a lot uh, of people do in order to be polite, um, that is actually a degendering term. Uh, it's refusing, you know, it, it's um, uh, blurring. Uh, transsexual women, transsexual men into a degendered entity. And there are, of course, people who refuse gender classification and for whom that term is perfectly appropriate, uh, trans people. Um, and there are people for whom the reproductive gender category is never applied, uh, intersex people, um, and struggle for recognition uh, in those terms too. And then there are people engaged in various forms of, of blend, gender blending, uh, gender mixing and so forth. There's queer deconstructionist positions. So uh, in, it's, it's not even, I think, right to talk about a trans spectrum as if somehow it was all neatly arrayed in a particular dimension. But there are the groups who get thrown under that umbrella whether they like it or not, who are actually living in very different situations and have different relationships to the gender order. Um, but uh, the, the, what is implied there, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that a, a pure social constructionist position can be undermining of uh, a number of, for a number of those groups, uh, just as a pure biological determinist position uh, would be undermining for a number of those groups, for most of those groups too, yes. So what do, what do we mean? What are we saying? We're saying that actually we need a sophisticated and complex theory of gender which will be better for everyone. Yeah, I agree with that. I like that. <laughs> I never quite thought that before, but you're right. It's ultimately in the interests of, of, of human beings generally. Have a good theory of gender. Well, my final question on gender, because there's you know a lot of other things obviously that we have to discuss. Um, but this one links a bit more to um, the OPR in its political purpose. And I was wondering about um, how you mentioned that a lot of you know, prominent figures in politics, a lot of prime ministers happen to be men. Um, and I was wondering how they, what, you know, what that means for different, you know, perceptions of gender, how potentially they set kind of a standard for men, but also how they set a standard for what 
a successful and capable politician looks like, which isn't female, you know? I want to ask about your thoughts on that. Hmm. Well, I think that's been quite powerful um, uh, effect uh, in politics. Um, in Australia, for instance, women had the vote uh, quite early. I think we got the vote in federal elections in Australia very soon after Australia was formed as a colonial state. Uh, in 1903, I think uh, we got the vote first. Um, but it was a long time, something like 40 years before we got the first women, women in elected to parliament. Uh, so in all that time, uh, women were half the electorate, but uh, men were all of the parliamentarians. Um, and, and that kind of mechanism, I think, is, is, is common. I, I think I forgot, I haven't got the latest statistics um, uh, in my head, but I think women globally make up something like 30% of parliamentarians. You probably know those figures better than I do. Um, it's less, way less than half anyway. And if you look at cabinets uh, or heads of government, they're much less again. Um, now, of course, you have particular women who've been able to break through uh, those. Um, yeah, glass ceiling is not a good, good metaphor, I think, but uh, have, have been able to break through those mechanisms. Uh, the first person to do that was actually in the post-colonial world, Mrs. Bandaranaika in Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, she, like perhaps the most prominent um, of women who did that, uh, performed that feat early in South Asia, uh, Indira Gandhi, was able to do it because of family connection. She was part of a ruling class elite political family. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, Margaret Thatcher, Angela Merkel, um, a small number of, of women have been able to do that, which shows that it's not a, a glass ceiling, absolute uh, exclusion. Um, but the fact uh, that it is overwhelmingly men points to a couple of important things, I think, about the gender order. Um, one is that elites uh, in gender terms as well as class terms are mainly self-selecting. Uh, so it's generals who promote the next generation of generals who choose their successors. It's elite corporate managers who choose their successors who promote the next generation of CEOs. Um, and it's mostly elite politicians who promote uh, you know, the next generation of, of political leadership. Um, and even when women do make it, uh, they can attract uh, vicious hostility. We've only had one woman prime minister in Australia. Uh, and for the three years or so she was in power, in office, I should say, in power, um, she was subject to extraordinary vilification. Uh, by uh, an aggressive leader of the opposition, by the right-wing press, um, <clears throat> by rumour and innuendo, uh, extra quite extraordinary stuff. Uh, even, uh, I mean, I, it's almost unspeakable. Um, she, uh, of course, like all women in mainstream politics, uh, was careful to define herself as not a feminist. Uh, so she could not be accused of being anti-man anti-male, um, but eventually, uh, in a way, she cracked and delivered a famous speech in Parliament, uh, which is available on YouTube and it's well worth looking at, which became known as the misogyny speech, uh, where she dressed down the leader of the opposition for, who was indeed, you know, a vile misogynist. Um, so, yeah, um, so what is that telling us? Something about the, the capacity of elites to reproduce themselves through self-selection but also I think maybe tells us something about the embedded organizational masculinity of political parties, uh, as well as corporations and religious organizations and so forth. Because to get in the position to be recruited to the top level of power, uh, you have to assemble networks and gain support and recognition and authority at lower levels of the organization. You have to be a backbencher before you're a minister, you have to be a you know, a, a priest before you're a bishop and a bishop before you're a cardinal and so on, um, or an archbishop. Um, so it, it tells us then something about the organizational culture of the dominant organizations in contemporary life too. I would like to talk a bit now about some work you've done more generally on knowledge. 
Um, but as kind of something that's kind of linked to that, I want to talk about, I wanted to start off with your time in the UN when you were, when you spent some time working with them and researching the role of men in achieving gender equity and informing international policy on this. Um, I was wondering in your experience, whether you felt that these international institutions um, can be or are effective in creating change when it comes to gender inequality, and whether this ever looks like northern countries, which often do tend to have more institutional power, um, dictating to southern ones. But then on the flip side of this, um, whether, you know, um, wh whether these international initiatives ensure that we aren't unduly, uh, that we aren't being unduly relativistic with regards to like, how we treat women in you know southern countries three questions is is no and yes no in the sense that uh, no international organization uh, like the united nations is going to produce social change um on a on a scale that, 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 that matters um and yes um <clears throat> international organizations like the united nations are mainly um controlled uh by rich countries by the global north broadly. Um, and uh, th to the extent that they do have influence, therefore it is quite likely to have the structure of ideas produced in the global north being imposed on the majority world, the global south. Um, now, having said that, uh, I now want to take some of it back. Uh, I was involved in, in the United Nations. I never worked for the United Nations. I, I, I suppose I, you would say I consulted for them, uh, but I did essentially um, volunteer work while I was work, uh, employed at a university or at a couple of universities. Um, and um, what I was involved in uh, basically was uh, discussions about um, how we could bring considerations about men into uh, state policies about gender equality, given that most governments in the world do have some kind of position on gender equality. There is the United Nations Agreement, to which I think just about every country signed up for the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. And indeed, the right to live without discrimination based on sex is there in the initial Declar Universal Declaration of Human Rights back in 1948 that uh, was put in there partly actually at the instigation of, of Australian feminists. Um, but um, that, um, uh, you know, that uh, the, the fact that the United Nations has basically an outgrowth in international diplomacy um, this both gives it a certain uh, authority and presence in the world. Governments can't quite ignore it, although they do their best to. Um, and many, uh, very often, they can't quite ignore it because they're part of it. Um, but it also means that it, the United Nations can only act on the world uh, by um, either moral exhortation, such as the Declaration of Human Rights or the Declaration Against uh, Discrimination. Um, uh, or by getting uh, governments to adopt policies with teeth in them that will, will you know, actually change uh, laws and, and institutions. So I was involved in, in discussions about how the, the various um, you know, policy statements and frameworks that existed for gender equity uh, could take better account of the position of men and the role of men in gender relations. Um, that without undermining the, uh, the, the emphasis on gender equality um, and the, uh, the attempt to expand the position of women, the, the recognition of women in arenas like diplomacy and elite levels of government that were predominantly masculinized or even very strongly masculinized, which was the case with the diplomatic world. Uh, so that was a, a somewhat delicate operation, which involved both beating the drum in public um, for making men, uh, for encouraging men to be active in pursuing gender equality and engaging in some quite intricate um, 
uh, discussions in, in around policy language and the way that policy instruments worked in uh, in, in uh, shifting into to actual organizational practice. So I was involved in those discussions, I suppose, for about about six years, something like six or seven years, maybe. Um, and I spoke there for various meetings um, um, organized by different uh, UN agencies. Um, and uh, it was a wonderful networking <laughs> experience, uh, getting in touch uh, with researchers, with activists, NGOs, government agencies, and so on and so forth around the world who had some kind of of interest in, in gender uh, gender equity, or as the United Nations puts it for good reasons, gender equality. Um, um, and, uh, and the results were, were not negligible. We, we got some quite serious policy documents out. Uh, whether they have made much difference in, uh, whether they've been implemented uh, very strongly, I don't know, I've never had the capacity to follow up and follow through on that. Um, but in any case, I don't think policy statements in an area like uh, equity uh, actually cause social changes. I think what they do is open, uh, open possibilities for social movements and organizations like NGOs uh, and state instrumentalities, um, if they have the desire, um, the policy instruments uh, give them the opportunity to give them, you know, an open door through which they can proceed. So uh, they're enabling documents rather than causal uh, documents, if you like, and that can have a pub, uh, a, a cultural effect, uh, not a quick one, but in the long run, the fact that are such statements matters to increasing numbers of people. Uh, there is a, if there's not a blueprint in such documents, but there's a declaration of principle, a set of examples and so forth. So one of the follow-up documents from our work in the, with the Commission on Status of Women in, in 2004, about four years later, um, uh, was a document that uh, both uh, uh, Re, um, if you like, reproduce the, 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 the declarations of the variety of ways in which men could become active in gender equity, in pursuit of gender equality, and, um, and how masculinities might change to enable that, but also listed a whole lot of programs that had arisen in different countries, either with NGOs or with governments, which had tried to put those ideas into practice. So there was actually a, a body of practical experience. I mean, there had been before, which we drew on in those discussions, certainly, but this was wider, uh, more varied and, and, and more interesting. So we were able to show a quite large range of, of practical programs that, that would advance the, the cause. And I, I was you know, immensely pleased with that. Because I'm often in the academic world, you wonder if you're spinning your wheels. You know, you spend years uh, on a research project. You then spend years getting the, the stuff published. Uh, and then you wonder, does this have any effect at all? Is anyone reading this? Uh, is anyone taking note of it? And is anything happening as a result of it? And in this case, we knew um, something was happening as a result. You know, that, is, that is quite a trip. I would like to finish off discussing um, your most recent work. Um, in 2019, you published The Good University. So I'd like to discuss higher education a bit. Um, what would you say are the main issues you identified with you know, the tertiary educational sector when writing this book? Mm. Well, uh, injustice, uh, inequality on a global scale, uh, as well as within regions and, and, and countries. Uh, the commodification of knowledge and the commercialization of universities, the, what I call the managerial takeover of universities, um, the persistence of um, uh, ex social exclusions uh, in the university world so that um, um, universities themselves have been organized increasingly in a gigantic hierarchy 
with enormous differences, enormous gaps of, of, of wealth, um, income, authority, and recognition, <coughs> excuse me, uh, between those at the top and those lower down. Um, uh, changes in the uh, pattern of, of funding of universities, which used to be principally public institutions um, and have increasingly been privatized and funded by charging of fees, uh, resulting in, in massive levels of student debt um, and the, 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 the reproduction of class exclusions. Um, the changed condition of the university workforce, where the university workforce is largely because of the corporate uh, character of university management now is increasingly casualized um, or outsourced, so uh, therefore insecure, um, rising levels of, um, of stress, overwork, um, and uh, intrusive control over the work of university workers, uh, which is led on, led on leading to uh, you know, rising levels of unhappiness uh, in the university workplace. Um, these, these are not happy institutions now. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in a golden age. I mean, when I was a graduate student, we mounted a movement against the university as it existed then. Um, and, and went off uh, in, in one of those movements, uh, went off to found, found our own uh, free universities that were supposed to do better. All that movement didn't last, we didn't find an economic base for it, but it did uh, make a critique of the, the very hierarchical uh, class bound institution universities were when I was a student, uh, and that was a good long time ago. Um, universities have never been ideal uh, uh, places and the idea that they've been, you know, happy bands of scholars uh, pursuing knowledge for its own sake has always been a bit ridiculous. Um, has always been mythical. Uh, they've always been vocational institutions, although the vocations uh, involved have, have changed. Uh, they've always had you know, rivalries and tensions and a great deal of hierarchy uh, within them. Um, the character of the hierarchy has now changed. Uh, some moves to democratize mainstream universities that were gaining ground in the 1960s, 70s and 80s have now been reversed under neoliberal policy regimes. Um, and universities now are less democratic places than they were 30, 40 years ago, uh, which is distressing, but it's a fact of life. So, um, I've uh, found, uh, you know, and, and I've been involved in some of those struggles myself, uh, some of the industrial struggles that have occurred in Australian universities and are occurring um, in British universities at the moment. Um, I've been an active unionist uh, in, in, in the university world, and I encourage everyone who's, uh, who's watching this, join the union. Uh, you've got to do it. That's the, the, the only way we're going to make progress. Um, uh, in in uh, the, the idea of writing this book actually came to me during the strike. We were on the strike. I was on the picket line. I was thinking about the situation we were in and began to think um, we, we're all too defensive. I mean, we're, we're on strike against very aggressive moves by a, a corporate style management. Um, but we need to be more on the front foot. We need to be pushing uh, for uh, the kinds of universities we think are what the society needs. Um, so we need to develop ideas about good universities and, and spread them. So that thought which came to me on the picket line, um, I, I felt I should you know, put my money where my mouth was and, uh, and actually try and, and develop a, an account of of good universities. Well, that took me back into, into the sociology of knowledge, into uh, thinking about what uh, research actually meant, what was the fundamental nature of, of the educational process in higher education. Um, took me back into thinking about the nature of the global university system. Um, took me into the, the, the much debated 
the managerial revolution in universities, what, what has been happening to universities under corporate style control. But more interesting than all that, I think, more novel than all that, was it took me back into the history of experimental universities, uh, which actually have been, you know, there's been experiment and, and including democratic and anti-colonial experiment in the universities for a long time. And there's an extraordinarily interesting and rich history, although it's not very well known, um, of um, you know, experimental colleges, student-run universities, popular science movements, working class knowledge movements, anti-colonial colleges, attempts to develop alternative curricula, indigenous curricula based on indigenous knowledge, indigenous colleges and universities, all of that. I mean, we should know about this. This should be well known in the university world and by and large it's not. And people still, you still see books and, and articles coming out by academics about the idea of a university in which they quote Newman, for God's sake, in, you know, uh, writing in England in the 1850s as their ideal of a university. Well, that was outdated at the time Newman wrote, actually, um, and, and as a model of what he, I mean, he was a good teacher, obviously, he has some nice things to say about teaching. As a model of university, it's absolutely ridiculous and, and irrelevant. Uh, and there's so much more, you know, in the history of universities that we could be interested in. Uh, that we could learn from I mean, student movements in in Latin America hundred years ago were struggling against you know conservative curricula and and the connection of universities with a, a reactionary power structure and opening up you know debates about who should be at the university and what what knowledge was and how pedagogy should work hundred years ago that was being being argued across Latin America. Um, a hundred years ago, Rabindranath Tagore in Bengal founded a college in opposition to the colonial university set up by the British in India, uh, which he thought of as a meeting place of civilizations, which should not only be based on indigenous Indian cultures, but Chinese culture, European culture as well. They should meet in a university curriculum. Well, they're still hardly moved on that issue. Most universities in the world still have a monocultural curriculum. They haven't heard of indigenous knowledge. They haven't heard of other cultures. They haven't heard of Islamic science, for heaven's sake, um, let alone think about how they might combine in a university curriculum. So there's wonderful resources out there, fascinating examples of how to, um, how to do different, how to do higher education differently and more inclusively. So that's, that's one of the chapters of the book where I, I rave uh, about all the, the, the missing history of, of universities and point to the, uh, you know, the wonderful material that's actually there. And, and then, of course, I try to put it together and think about the future. And that's, that's tough, how, what might be our criteria for a good university now, um, what, uh, what might be the kinds of social coalitions that would reform the university system. Uh, and what, you know, if you do a little bit of science fiction, which is always good for the imagination, you know, if we were in a, a, a research institute in 200 years time, what would it be like? Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to do. Um, it, uh, as you can tell, it sort of brings together, you know, various parts of, of, of my work over a much longer period, thinking about the sociology of knowledge, about the nature of social practice, um, about democratic movements, about you know, the relationship between policies and, and institutions. All of that, I guess, comes together. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I hope it will, it will help the movements uh, that are going on to, uh, to democratize universities, to make them better working places, to make them better educational places too. Yeah, because like I feel like I feel like, for example, Oxford is a prime example of a lot of what you talk about. It's, you know, it's it's in the metropole. It's a, it's a very elitist upper class institution, or at least, you know, it gets a lot of criticism for that. And it's also one which reproduces class structures quite a bit because, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have the resources, I feel, to get in and meet like a certain, you know, type of person, which, you know, I, as a as a woman and also as like a foreigner, I don't necessarily meet, but also you know, then afterwards people favor graduates from these kinds of universities. So then how do you, how do you break, how do you, how do you break the holds these universities have had for so many years? I mean, these universities have been around since 
you know, th- the Oxford's been around for like a thousand years. Um, yeah, Oxford is, is interesting, um, uh, including the fact uh, that it's been funded partly by medieval land grants um, from the, the, uh, that created a, a position which institution has been able to, uh, to reproduce. But if you asked where the, the you know, um, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, the, the Ivy League universities in the United States, it's, it's by no means alone uh, in this kind of position. And the, then the, the, uh, the universities that were created by multi-millionaires in the United States, like Stanford, University of Chicago, which um, people often don't realize was actually funded by Rockefeller oil money. Um, the, um, but if you were to ask, where is the exciting and original uh, work in universities, the, the good educational thinking about higher education that has happened in these countries in the last hundred years, it's not in those those universities. Um, In England, for instance, it's in the so-called Greenfields universities that were set up in from the late 1950s onwards. They were the ones who really, you know, imagined new curricula or or the open university, which began to think about new forms of distance education and also began to think creatively about the redesign of of disciplines, the re the, how the map of knowledge is changing and could be, be put into new curricula. Uh, it's the Greenfields universities or that generation of universities which really did the creative thinking, the forward thinking, um, and, and really should be much more prominent in their thinking about universities. But the, with the kinds of um, you know, neoliberal influenced uh, corporate connected right-wing governments that, that we've got, uh, the tendency has been to to reduce most universities to basically the function of vocational colleges and concentrate our research uh, resources in uh, a narrow elite group of universities. And that's been happening in most of the English speaking world over the last mm, 30 years, 35 years perhaps. It's very depressing because exactly the opposite is what we want for a lively higher education and research culture. All right. Well, <laughs> that's thank you so, 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 so much, um, Professor Kong, for an incredible interview. Um, and, and Well, thank you. Uh, it's been uh, interesting to me. I'm sorry that I've, I get carried away, as you will see, by, oh, by these issues sometimes. But um, I, I've, I've been very privileged in my life to be able to work on, on things that I thought mattered. And um, that's, that's what an you know, intellectual worker can best hope for.